Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we get to sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players and related music industry experts. If you love playing guitar, stick around. You're in the right place. Hey, this is Craig Garber from Everyone Loves Guitar. And if you're a guitar player who's looking to make some more money, then listen very closely to what I'm about to tell you. If you're a guitar player or any other kind of musician for that matter, or if you know a musician who wants to make some more money without having to tour or go on the road or put up with any of the other BS musicians normally have to deal with, then you need to download this new special report about how to make a small fortune by licensing your music. And by licensing music, I mean getting your music inserted into movies, television shows, and commercials. The report is less than 20 pages long, and it was written by Mike Elsner, who I interviewed in episode number 167 of this show. Mike's been doing this for over 14 years, and he's had over 2,000 songs licensed at this point in time. That means he's getting paid to license almost 150 songs per year. Now, keep in mind, most successful career musicians don't get paid for 150 songs in total over a 30 or 40 year career. Yet Mike's getting paid for this on an annual basis. And the cool thing about this business is that you can run it from your own home studio and you'll never have to deal with ivory tower record label executives telling you what to play and how to play it and no shady managers or unethical business people telling you what to do either. So download Mike's free ebook on the four step plan to licensing success right now. Just go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash Mike. That's everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash Mike, M-I-K-E. Let me know how you like the book. And now let's get on with the show. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber from Everyone Loves Guitar. And I've got a guitar player's guitarist with us today. We're with the, uh, the really talented Jim Campolongo. Jim's got 12 albums of original material. And uh, he's made guest appearances on literally dozens of recordings from uh, Cakes, Million Selling, Prolonging the Magic, to most recently doing lead guitar duties with the Little Willies, which is his band with Nora Jones. Jim's played with J.J. Kale, Al Anderson, Gillian Welch, and David Rawlings, Peter Rowan, Martha Wainwright, Bright Eyes, Teddy Thompson, and Burning Spear, just to name a few. He's earned two gold records, and he's written music for national ads for National Grid, Volkswagen, SBC, Michelin, and Jack Daniels. He's also had repeat appearances on The Late Show with David Letterman, Late Night with Conan O'Brien, Later with Jules Holland, which is one of my favorite, probably my favorite music show, and Abbey Road Sessions on the BBC. He's also a published guitar teacher and contributing editor to Guitar Player Magazine, and his True Fire instructional video, Sonic Telly, continues to be a bestseller, along with his own Lessons by Mail, which he offers on his website at jimcampolongo.com, and we'll talk about that later. In 2013, Fender bestowed Jim the honor of the Campolongo Signature Telecaster, a high-quality instrument made by Fender's Elite Custom Shop. He's also a featured endorser of Daddario String Company, Celestian Speakers, and Lava Cables. And in 2017, master guitar builder Chiho Han collaborated on the Han Jim Campolongo Model C Telecaster. It's a boutique guitar, high quality, but it's actually pretty affordable, and uh, I actually saw it. Uh, looked at looked up a lot of information online uh, where you could find on Han um, Chico Han's website. I think he's upstate New York. Recently, Jim released his twelfth record. It's Jim Campolongo with Chris Morrissey and Josh Dion live at Rockwood Music Hall in the city. Guitar Modern calls it one of the year's ten best releases, and we're going to discuss some of these tracks today. I listened to the entire record; it's fucking brilliant. And uh, I want to just tell a couple of stories about Jim. First of all, this guy is one of the most organized and disciplined on on top of his shit people I've ever dealt with. It's been really great dealing with him like since the first minute I talked with him. Um, and I want to tell a little story. So I get an email one day from Jim. It was like 4.30 in the morning. And I think that was before we had talked. And I talked to him. I said, Jim, you know, you're a musician. What the hell are you doing up at 4.30 in the morning? And I knew he wasn't up from the night before. I just got the sense he wasn't that guy. And, he, and, and this is what he told me. He goes, hey, I get up at 4.30 or 5 every day because then I get some quiet time to go through my emails and practice. And I have since told that story to a few other guitar players that I know knew Jim or knew of him. And I got the same, res one of two responses from all of them. It was either, wow, I'm ashamed. I'm not doing anything remotely like that, and I should be. Or that is very, knowing Jim's playing 
the way I do, it's very easy to believe that he's doing that. So that being said, Jim, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for coming on the show, man. Oh, that was that was such a beautiful introduction. I just want to end the interview now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll send you the I'll send you the MP3 of the intro. You can just put it in your put it on repeat on on your iTunes. When I'm depressed, I'll put it on. Yeah, yeah. man. I'm just like the happy pills for uh, guitar players. No, thank you very much. It was really gracious and well done. Thank you. You're welcome and thank you, man. I read somewhere and I thought this was so cool that you used green stamps to purchase your first guitar. Is that true? Well, yes and no. Um, I, I've seen that, and it might even be in my bio. I'm not sure, but the truth is it was a green stamp guitar. Uh, and the, a guy across the street named Austin Slater uh, played guitar, and I used to go over, just walk across the street, and he'd be in the garage strumming this acoustic and I just thought he was fantastic. Uh, you know, he probably knew uh, eight first position chords, but he'd play and I'd say, wow, what's that, Austin? And he'd say, that's Let It Be by the Beatles. And I couldn't really hear it, you know, because there wasn't any vocals or there wasn't a little organ interlude or the guitar solo, but I just thought he was great. And so he ended up getting a, uh, a better guitar guitar and he gave me that green stamp guitar and i still have it um and that's the guitar i learned on so that's that's the uh full story that's the full story awesome how old were you when this happened i was uh about 13 just about to turn 14 gotcha it's funny because i you know i uh i grew up in new york and they had s and h green stamps too and i I haven't yeah, and I haven't heard that. You know, I don't hear that often. That's one of those things like, oh, green stamps. It's like a forgotten memory or forgotten thing that existed, you know, in the back of my brain. So it was kind of kind of uh, nostalgically cute when I, when I read that. <laughs> um, I also read, then I thought this was very cool too, that you, this is all on Wikipedia, I saw this. You used to buy albums based exclusively on how long the tracks were because you loved improv so much. And my question is, is that true? And if so, what did you love about improvising and how did it make you feel? And does it still make you feel the same way? Well, yes on, I think yes on all those questions. Um, Now, you know, I was probably at this point, a 12 year old kid. Um, And I like the Beatles. And I remember I really liked you know, some corny songs like Smile, A Little Smile for Me, Rosemary. I forget who th- did that. Mm-hmm. But cer- certain songs that were just AM stuff. But somehow I knew I really liked long improv, um, but I didn't know what it was called. I, I didn't know you'd call it long improv. Maybe jamming, you know, was in my uh, vocabulary, but I don't recall that. But I remember finding uh, East West by uh, the Paul Butterfield Blues Band. Oh, what, um, what an album. And, and I w- realized, you know, with a complete lack of information, because obviously this is maybe 1974, so it's way pre internet. I just go out and thumb through records, and if there was one song on the side of a record, I thought, okay, this is for me. Um, and I ended up really getting lucky. I, I got a, uh, well, I got a Larry Coriel record called Barefoot Boy. I also got John Coltrane live in Japan. And there's a song on there called Peace on Earth. And it's uh, two sides of a record, of a double record. Um, that still sounds fantastic. And then uh, I discovered Cream. Hmm. And uh, I mean, at the time, you know, I was a testosterone filled young man. So I would listen to cream and primarily spoonful or, uh, NSU off, uh, cream (laughs) volume two. Great song. Great album. I just wanted to start breaking furniture. I mean, (laughs) it just filled me with, you know, it was like a joyous energy. It sounds like rage, but you probably remember that feeling. Um, and, uh, I ended up finding uh, uh, another uh, uh, track that was really important to me um, was uh, Derek and the Dominoes' live Let It Rain. Yeah. Uh, 
the first half of that solo I still think is 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 brilliant and people might think it sounds uh, cliche ridden but you know I try to remind people that well he was defining these cliches uh, and that's and in part they became cliches because of him hmm. um, and uh, ironically Rolling Stone magazine uh, named it number the number one worst solo of all time you know a few years back when they had those uh lists that were probably just to inspire a uh, debate and therefore debate about rolling stone magazine mm -hmm. but uh that was another really important track and i i think it was 16 minutes long so i looked at that and thought yep that's for me if a, if a record even a jazz record of an artist i didn't know or a guitarist i didn't know um were they were four or five minutes i wouldn't buy it and i've often thought hmm i wouldn't have bought one of my own records <laughs> <laughs> i mean actually uh just the, i would have bought live at rockwood because cock and bull stories 10 minutes long so young jim campolongo might have bought that record but uh, and i also discovered john mclaughlin and this is all before i played guitar uh you know, I was a total civilian at the time, but uh, it was all all those roads were leading to me getting this uh, green stamp guitar from Austin Slater across the street. So did you ever listen to any Pink Floyd? No, I you know, I I remember this one live record uh, I liked called Shine On You Crazy Diamond. Um, but they're the kind of group. For me, and I don't want to insult anybody or you or anybody who's a big fan, I could kind of imagine them or something. Like, I don't really need to listen to them. Like, I don't really need to listen to the Eagles. You know, if if Witchy Woman comes on, I'm, I'm happy enough, but it's almost like I could imagine it. And and I don't feel that way about the Beatles necessarily. Um if you put on everybody's got something to hide except me and my monkey, I'd probably sit up in my chair and check it out again. But I don't know what it is. They don't, they weren't, they didn't have enough depth for me or anger. Um, for example, I could still totally rock out with Bon Scott ACDC, you know, which yeah. has, uh, uh, less parts than Pink Floyd, for example, or Eagles or whatever. Um, so that's just me, though. That's yeah, just yeah. My well, that's music, man. That's why, you know, it's like ice cream. You know, somebody likes chocolate and the other guy says, oh, I hate chocolate. You know, could be your best friend even. So, no, I totally get that. I want to talk about your last re or your newest release, Live at Rockwood. Uh, for people who aren't familiar with Rockwood in, in New York, why don't, you, why don't you tell everybody where it is? Well, it's on Allen Street in the Lower East Side, and it's a premier New York nightclub, and uh, they have mostly great acts almost every hour. Uh, and um, you know, it's 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 a great stage. We play in Rockwood too. The sound is really good, but it's intimate enough to where you see the whites of the eyes of the audience. And uh, you know, that's where we play every Monday, and uh, I, uh, we all really love it. And, you know, years ago, that whole area, how long have you been in the city? Well, I was, I was in the Lower East Side in 2001, and even then, it was, it was much different than it is. <laughs> yeah. yeah, when I was a kid, like, you couldn't really, it was, like, very industrial, and, like, the Bowery was basically Skid Row. You'd literally, <laughs> you'd walk down Bowery, and it's, like, like naked or half-naked people just, you know, heroined out and, like, it was a bad place. You wouldn't go there too often. And now it's, you know, it's shishi. Yeah. I mean, I, I was looking at Katz's deli the other day and it looked like it was dropped into Las Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That place been around a long time. <laughs> hey, on, on the live in Rockwood album, the first track, uh, I'm Helen. Ke it's called I'm Helen Keller, and you're a waffle iron. I have a, a few questions about it. First of all, I would encourage people to watch and listen. First of all, go out and buy the record, but watch Jim. If if you don't know his playing, he's got a ton of stuff on YouTube. It's a that song I think is actually on YouTube. It's a great, a really intense long jam. Uh, second question is I don't usually ask about names of songs because that's very like too stereotypical but 
this is a particularly unusual name. I'm Helen Keller, and you're a waffle iron. So I wanted to know the backstory to that. Well, I, in some ways, I regret uh, using that title because it, it does offend some people and I don't want to offend people necessarily, but, um, it's, it's kind of a, an amalgamation of, of, a, of a joke. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the joke was, uh, how did Helen Keller burn her fingers trying to read the waffle iron? Um, uh, okay. you know, and, uh, but I, I, put it together as a, uh, my, uh, attempt at, uh, um, trying to convey a, uh, frustrating relationship. <laughs> gotcha. Um, oh, so, that's interesting. So that song is, you wrote that song about a frustrating relationship you were having. Well, some, I mean, I think that it might've been around that time, but quite honestly, um, I have a folder full of what I think might be interesting, uh, uh, song titles. Sure. Uh, Sometimes I just play the song and I just immediately name it. Uh, you know, uh, again, I, I like to fly by the seat of my pants. Um, uh, hence, you know, not getting the questions beforehand and, um, going in and improvising and uh i I like that and sometimes i feel like that's the most real thing Mm. but sometimes i'll I'll, if i think of something that i like um like i'm helen keller and you're a waffle iron even the second track big bill was uh one of the titles many years ago i had put in a folder as a title and i liked big bill because it meant so many things um it could be a guy that named bill who's big it could be something you get in the mail, like a big bill. Mm-hmm. It could be something on the uh, mouth of a duck, yes. a big bill. Yep. It could be something that's uh, trying to get passed through Senate, a big bill. You know, I could yeah, go yeah. on and on. Um, there's so many meanings. So sometimes um, I'll just jot something down and go through the list on the latest. And uh, as I finish a song or have finished it and think, oh, yeah, this one could be big bill or this one could be that. But I think I'm Helen Keller and you're a waffle iron did really coincide uh, with each other. This uh, relationship I was in, um, as well as the uh, song when it was written, which was originally on my record Orange. Uh, But we had such a good take of it uh, that I wanted to put it on Live at Rockwood because the uh, middle section was very unique. We've only played it the way it's on the record one time. And uh, everybody broke down and uh, meaning they stopped playing at one point and I did these weird harmonics and I, I, I really felt like it was uh, a really nice imp- improvisation. It's great. I'd, I would like to, to see you guys and like watch that song for about 20 minutes, to be honest <laughs> with you. That's a really cool song. It's, it's very well done. Thanks it it sucks, man. I'm going to be in the city in May, but I'm leaving on a Monday, which sucks. I would have loved to come see you play. Well, if you're in there the second Sunday of the month, uh, we play for the 55 bar as well as the second Sunday of every month. And we have for 15 years. That's awesome. A 15 year residency. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Oh, wait a minute. The 55. I, I just talked to someone else the other day who plays there. Uh, 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 Jake Katz, I think. Or Jake, huh. no, he's a broad, he's a Broadway guy. Um, oh, I know him. Yeah. yeah, he got got me in a play, me and my mother, and he does like a Van Hay, Van Halen thing. Uh, I, at least that's what I think, and I'm so embarrassed I can't remember his last name. It's um, um, I am too. I'll tell you right now, it's Jake. Uh, now I'm having a brain fart. This is terrible, man. That guy, Jake great. Schwartz. Jake Schwartz. Yeah, Jake Schwartz. Yeah. And what was that Mormon play? Uh, uh, Book of Mormon. He, he's in that. Book? Yes, and he uh, he got my mother and I. My mother visited a few years back, and we went there, and we loved it. And my mother and I were just laughing hysterically. And, and then he brought us backstage, and it was so gracious of him. Uh, and I've been meaning to see him at the 55 bar. So, yeah, that's him. He's a good guy, and he's a really good guitarist. There you go. So I, I hear a lot of, and I want to qualify this after I, I, I say it, I hear a lot of Roy Buchanan's influence in your playing in general, but particularly on that song, on the I'm Helen Keller song. But I want to make it like perfectly clear to the listeners that 
Jim's not playing Roy Buchanan. Not there's nothing remotely, but you hear his influence on there. It's and it's more the fact for me anyway that he plays a telly. He really does very unusual and difficult and tasteful harmonics, and really it's more like you. That instrument is like your bitch, and <laughs> like you know, you, whatever you want it to do. And I don't mean that in a condescending way because I know that's not how you look at the guitar. But like whatever you want it to do, you've got total command, even stuff that it's not meant to do. And that's what Roy did a lot. And and I was curious, uh, like, you know, was he one of your influences, or where do you see him in 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 your playing and your interpretation of things? Well, you know, definitely Roy was an influence, um, and uh, in, a, in a lot of ways, um, I learned a lot from him just from seeing him. I think I saw him probably like 20 times, and again, wow. we're going back Wow, where'd you see this. him? Oh, every time, every show, he, he, when he came to, I was living in the Bay Area, I'd see every show, um, early, late show, every night. Wow. Uh, so... Um, and again, this is going back to the stone age before video and, uh, you know, instructional videos and the internet and all that. So, uh, when I saw him, um, I learned many things from him. One was, um, you know, just that a Telecaster and an amp was a really nice sound that I liked. It was a nice, pure sound. Um, and uh, I also learned about volume and tone control swells. I also, uh, and I had no idea, you know, about hybrid picking. That's where you use a pick in your fingers or your picking hand, or in most cases, your right hand. And I saw him do that. Um, and the other thing that uh, still sticks with me uh, is uh, he didn't use much vibrato. Um, and it was almost alarming like how little vibrato he would use and how effective it was. And uh, because of that, to this day, you know, I, I don't use uh, a, a ton of vibrato. And when I do give a lesson, it's usually an observation I make. You know, I'm nice and I don't want to alter anybody's voice. But a lot of players uh, use vibrato and it sounds a bit autopilot and it sounds a little bit like, you know, Figaro, you know, to me. Yeah. Um, and, uh, so, uh, Roy also turned me on to that. Um, and so, and I like to sound, you know, I, 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 uh, I mean, Roy, you, you get these guys. I mean, I, when I was in high school and I went to go see Roy, I mean, I just thought he was an old man. I mean, and, and now you look back and, oh, he was 33, Yeah. you know, um, and at this point, I mean, so uh, as I said, you know, at the beginning of the interview, I'm 59. And so for me to go out there and, and play like Roy Buchanan would just, for me, indicate a lack of growth. Um, but even when, you know, we're recording a new record and we've just done Round Midnight by Thelonious Monk and we covered uh, In a Sentimental Mood that is Duke Ellington or maybe Billy Strayhorn or both. Uh, and I, I, I try to use a kind of a Buchanan-esque sound uh, because I find that to be, uh, well, it's, it's my face, you know, for lack of a better sure. description. And, and to me, a, a Telecaster sounds much more like Louis Armstrong than in, you know, ES-175 through a polytone amp. So uh, in some ways, I'm still championing uh, Roy's sound, uh, you know, uh, though I think it's uh, mellowed some uh, than, than back in the day. You mean your, your, your playing has mellowed some or your, uh, your, his influence on what you're doing tonally? Yeah, okay. the the latter. Uh, you know, I'm not going out there and playing uh, uh, Green Onions, you know, yeah. for uh, eight minutes. You know, uh, I mean, but I did on Orange. I have a, a a tribute to him called Blues for Roy, um, where I uh, play some things that he played. Uh, primarily, the the record that really 
blew my mind and the track there was one track in particular called pete's blues oh god and, <laughs> yeah and uh that's another you know i forgot to mention that uh back when i was 12 uh roy starts playing a middle eastern section uh, that just to this day is you know gives me chills i i i have chills right now just talking about it and i always loved that first record and and that um uh, documentary uh, that that uh, a, a public uh, station did. I forgot what it was called. The world's greatest unknown guitarist, yeah. and he plays uh, Misty uh, and, and stuff like that. He plays with Merle Haggard, and I always felt that uh, Roy's earlier releases, when he was uh, a bit more versatile, are the the records that I still go to, um, and uh, I really like what he was you know, getting into, and I would have liked if he pursued that more, but I say that humbly because, you know, in a lot of ways he was and is my mentor, at least as far as sound goes, and he was a genius. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, for me to be critical would be arrogant and inappropriate, but uh, those, those the, the first record and the second record are the ones that I still go to and, and still marvel at. You know, it's interesting. You mentioned that he would play some of the um, like the uh, Middle Eastern stuff. Bloomfield, another telly player, did that also in uh, East West, another album that you mentioned earlier. Right. That's 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 you know hit the nail on the head, and I was really attracted to that. I I actually like this uh, John Fahey record too, where he kind of drones and a detuning. For some reason, I was really attracted to that, and you know I bring up Mike Bloomfield to this day because I thought he was you know a great white blues player. Um, you know, I love that uh, uh, Super Sessions record uh -huh. was a big, big influence on me, and and certainly the uh, Butterfield Blues Band. Funny enough, um, and I don't want to bore the listeners by talking too much, but I went to go see Mike Bloomfield when I was in high school, and it was an advertised show, um, and uh, my friend Dennis Garibaldi and I went there and at the time we were like Cheech and Chong or something. <laughs> we drove over to San Rafael and the smoke was billowing out of the sides of the Toyota <laughs> and we, we, we couldn't wait to see Mike Bloomfield and I was hoping he'd have his Les Paul and, you know, crank some blues. And anyway, I think it was in San Rafael. This is back in the California days. And we got to this place and it was a pizza parlor. And uh, Mike Bloomfield was sitting there, and there wasn't a whole lot of people. There was a chair and an acoustic guitar. And I was really disappointed. I thought, this is in Super Sessions. <laughs> and uh, so he sat down, and he played two or three uh, acoustic numbers. And they were good, but I had this specific uh, expectation that wasn't being fulfilled. And then he said, now I'm going to show a movie. <laughs> and I, I, I thought, What? And he showed this film, and it was on a 16 millimeter, you know, that clicked away, turned off the lights in this pizza parlor. And he uh, showed players like Hound Dog Taylor and T Bone Walker and Albert King. And I learned so much. It, it, it kind of changed my life. And, uh, you know, it's funny uh, how looking back, like what was a real disappointment at one minute turned out the next day I was at the record factory, if you remember that, because uh, that there was one by my house. It was like Tower Records, maybe not as good, but it's hmm. called the Record Factory. And I got a, a Hound Dog Taylor record and a T-Bone Walker record. And, you know, I think I think I was hip to Albert King, actually, already because of uh, Cream. Uh but uh, Mike, I owe a lot to Mike Bloomfield, um, and uh, you know, I, I I wish I could thank him. Yeah, he was a great. Uh, I, I loved playing. He, you know, he he his stuff did it for me as well. Uh, another track on Live at Rockwood, Cock and Bull Story. You've got loads of sustain on there. I mean, really. I mean, I know. Like I was thinking about that when you said you don't do a lot of vibrato, and you know that was I'd never thought of that, but that was really interesting because you're right. He is not uh, a vibrato guy at all, but he 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 was he did throw a lot of sustain in there as you do on this one. I mean, you do in general, but on this one particular song, I found there's loads of sustain, and 
I, I, my gut says you're not using pedals. Right. On that, you know, at Rockwood thus far, I've, yeah, I've never used a pedal. Um, I use uh, pedals on my, what probably will be my upcoming record. And, uh, but no, it's just straight into the amp. You know, it's funny. Um, I mean, I have a guitar here. I don't know if you could hear this, but yeah, like, I remember the lick Ripe would play. And, uh, a lot of times, like, can you hear that? Oh, God, sounds gorgeous, okay. man. Tell me, tell us, <laughs> all right, hold on a minute. Tell us what you're playing and what you're playing out of. It's a 59 uh, Telecaster top loader through, uh, let me look down here, uh, through a Princeton. Okay. But anyway. What, okay. what, what so, size, what size strings? No, I'm just fucking. <laughs> 009 there, 009 to 42. <laughs> you can ask me again. No. Okay. So. At the time, I was probably going, and I saw Roy, and Roy would do, and there's just no vibrato, and he was bending up to the flat five very accurately, and and uh, that's specifically what I saw, and I just thought it was so personal. So anyway, that's a musical demonstration of what we're talking about. I hope you don't mind. Well, I'd like to just end the interview here on on this hand and listen to you play for another 25, 30 uh, minutes. That would on. be great. Thank you. Um, so basically, he really influenced your phrasing. Well, I, I think his sound did. I mean, I read somewhere that he was trying to say, help me. And... I, you know, I, I I think my phrasing has been influenced by other musicians, I mean, uh, than Roy. But what he did, and again, I'll just grab the guitar. I mean, things like this, like the, uh, I, I don't know what kind of sound I'll get. I'm here in my New York apartment, but that. <laughs> like stuff like that. I mean, really. Uh, was expressive and the whole, you know, thing. Um, wow. I, I always really liked. Uh, this stuff I don't do too much anymore. You know, those I can't really get it. The, the squeals that are now attributed to ZZ Top. Um, but those kind of things really appeal to me. But probably my phrasing now is, is, is uh, Probably, I don't know. I mean, maybe more of a horn thing sometimes uh, and definitely a vocal thing. I mean, uh, you know, I, I think of uh, when I'm playing, it's more of a vocalist than a, uh, you know, alpha blues or something like that, sure. you know. <laughs> so so how, how do you, your sustain, I mean, like, you know, there's ever, you know, probably 75% of the people listening are guitar players. You know, we want to know how did how do you get that freaking sustain so long with like that's it a cable and a a guitar and an amp. Well, I mean, I I'm flattered by the question, and I guess um, I mean that's the answer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I use a, a fairly short cable. Um, you know, nothing longer than 15 feet. And I play through a cranked Princeton, which is kind of a glorified, you know, distortion pedal. Uh, that's what a distortion pedal is trying to copy. Okay. Um, and, you know, in some ways it's a little one dimensional. And I do, I mean, that said about the sustain, I do miss getting whole notes sometimes. Uh, and, I mean, it isn't enough sustain sometimes, and it is a little more work because um, the guitar doesn't really compress uh, as much as if you're playing through a pedal, hmm. uh, which I think makes life easier on your right hand, uh, your picking hand. But yeah, if it's a cranked amp uh, through a you know with a good guitar, um, you know you're gonna. That's what a distortion unit's trying to copy. Um, so, but I do miss pedals. Like I, I, I always enjoy using them. I use like a Stardust pedal by Crazy Tube Circuits, and I really enjoy using a Wah pedal. Um, and I really enjoy using a Boomerang Phrase Sampler, and I like backward looping and stuff like that. Uh, I think it's very creative. And you got you got guys like Duke Levine or Mike Campbell, and they're getting 
a full menu of sounds. Uh, uh, sometimes I feel uh, a little limited by the the three good sounds I might get. Uh, Why don't you use I'm, pedals then? Like it, it just is it that the, that venue not conducive or? Well, I do and I will. For example, this Sunday at the 55 bar, I'm going to bring uh, at least three pedals. And uh, and so I do use them in my trio. Uh, thus far, I haven't. And it's it's been kind of a, I don't know what the word is, but I mean, it's like it's sometimes – uh, one isn't bigger than the group they're in. Um, and my group, my trio has a certain sound and I, it, bringing an effect would almost feel a little inappropriate in some ways, especially if I'm going on uh, 12 records of material that don't have an effect. Sure. But my next record will have uh, effects and, uh, and, I, I can't wait because it's a it's a nice uh, learning process for me and it's a new thing. And, you know, it's not like now I'm going to sound like, uh, you know, Robert Fripp on acid or something. <laughs> something. I mean, it's still it's still going to be me, but uh, I, I'm going to have some some new sounds to employ and apply. Uh, that said, if we're playing around midnight or. Uh, uh, in a sentimental mood or something like that, or a, an original I wrote called Coal. Um, it just seemed appropriate to have a, a pure guitar sound. Uh, so, but I'm, I'm going to branch out a little bit more. Well, uh, let me just tell the listeners that um, Jim mentioned another guitar player called Duke Levine. Duke's a brilliant guitarist out of Connecticut, and I interviewed him in episode 162 so you either go to the website everyone loves guitar.com or itunes or wherever you listen um well worth it is one of the more popular interviews great player also telecaster player and you brought up a point jim i was i had a question for you about this your band that trio is incredibly tight and i know you know you think you guys have been playing together like you know very long time and i don't believe you have so i was wondering Oh, we have. Oh, you have. How long have you guys been playing together? Five years. Man, that's. You sound like. I mean, like really tight. I mean, have you guys do you practice all the time, or how many? Never. Do- um, we never practice, uh, wow. and we never practice a new song. Um, and but we play a lot, and uh, though you know, when you start playing with excellent musicians like Duke Levine or Josh Dion, who's my drummer, or Chris Morrissey, who plays bass. I think really great uh, musicians and artists create chemistry. Hmm. Um, and hmm. we had a we kind of had a nice chemistry from the get-go. Uh, I remember our first gig about halfway in, and I hadn't met Josh until that gig. I mean, we didn't practice at all. And uh, I asked him, I was looking for a drummer, uh, he was referred to, uh, to me by two people that I respected, including Chris, because hmm. I asked Chris, uh, who just had joined the band, maybe it was his second gig. I said, what drummers do you like? And he said, Josh Dion. So Josh came with us. It was probably the second time I played with Chris. And we had an in- instant chemistry. And it's grown since Dream Dictionary. That's the first record I made with them. Uh but yeah, we, we play at least once a week and listen really hard. And I am really proud of that band. It has a, it, it's, it's a well-oiled machine. <laughs> you know? Very much so. And you know, it's cool. They, they've, they are receptive when you, in, you, do, you interact with the audience really well. You're not like talking to them all night, but you're, you're, you're talking to them enough to get them engaged and keep everybody flowing, which I thought was great. And they know how to react off of what you're saying, which is really cool. And you can hear that. And that's really awesome. In a, in a well, they're, they're just great musicians and I've learned so much from them and I've grown so much because of them. Uh, when we first met, I was a little insecure about, uh, playing free or, uh, venturing uh, uh, very far from the tightrope um, or losing one, you know, sometimes, uh, I mean, to this day, I might, might uh, miss where one is if we really go out. And those guys always know where one is. It's usually me. 
And if I do get lost, uh, and which isn't often, but if I do, it's, it's always dealt with with total kindness and appreciation that I took a chance. And um, when you're in that kind of environment, it's very conducive to learning. Uh, instead of having somebody yell at you and hit your fingers with a ruler or whatever. Um, so, I, you know, and I'm not really um, trying to be nice here. I mean, I've learned a lot from those guys and continue to learn a lot. Uh, they're just great musicians. And uh, and it's one of the reasons why Live at Rockwood sounds like it does is um, I'm trying to keep up with them. <laughs> mm. No, I get that. I get what you're saying for sure. It, 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 you're, you're really tight. And one thing, uh, pat on the back to you, because I would never have known that you're not, when you're, as the listener, you're definitely not giving any indication of, well, you know, I'm, I might be treading thin ground here going out of my comfort zone, or maybe you have at one time, but you're, you certainly don't hear that in your playing. That thing was like, like again, like, you mentioned a well-oiled machine. It really is. It was really enjoyable to listen to you guys. So I was like, shit, I wish I was going to see you play. Um, your songs, they're, you're a very deliberate guy. I don't think you do things. I don't get the sense anyway that you kind of like randomly do things outside of trying stuff. But I, I get the sense like, for example, the placement of the climaxes in your song is deliberate. And you don't write in like a very conventional, you know, verse, chorus, verse type of a meter. And I don't really have a question here because everything sounds great, but I, I guess if maybe the question is like, uh, is your songwriting designed to complement or leverage the way you like playing? You know, not at all. I mean, I, I, I try to write a good piece of music. Um, and a lot of times after I do it, I discover that I'm not super comfortable soloing on it, or I even wonder if it needs a solo. And it's a challenge to, uh, to keep the spirit of the song um, intact and solo and come up with something that's interesting and a departure uh, within the context of the trio. Hmm. Um, and I generally write, you know, a, a a B A form, uh, you know, before I, I started writing, I, I learned a gazillion songs. And, uh, because of that, I got a good overview of, of harmony and progression. Um, and I feel lucky because of it, because I think sometimes if people are just influenced and I'm not, you know, don't take this the wrong way, but by Bob Dylan or Joni Mitchell or something who, who, you know, it's the lyrics that come first and the song structure second, as opposed to Duke Ellington, where if you listen to Prelude, do a kiss or something like that, it's it's just a great um, uh, song within a structure. So my songs are really structured. I mean, it, it, uh, I mean, so but within that, I, I usually just try and write a really good melody. And uh, generally, I'll sing something. And sometimes I just tape myself singing. Uh, and then I learn what I was singing. And a lot of times it isn't exactly where my fingers would have wanted to go. Um, and then sometimes I find myself thinking, well, how do I solo over this? Um, you know, it's so it, it, it's really not a vehicle. I mean, some of the 10 gallon cat stuff that um, is my earlier records are a vehicle for soloing, but certainly the last 10 years or so, no way. Mm. It, it, it sounds great. That's what, whatever you're doing, keep it up. <laughs> not that you need me, you don't need me to tell you that, but no, no that's really nice. Thank you. In the last two, you have two songs right before the end, back to back. It's Sal's Waltz, which is a really pretty waltz, and then something called There You Are, which I thought was a really beautiful, like, sad song. And I was curious what the backstory to those two are, and is there any particular reason why they're connected other than, you know, it was a live show and you just moved from one into the other? Well, the reason they're connected is really because of uh, <laughs> uh, vinyl... Uh, time restrictions. 
Um, I know that's a very unromantic answer. It is, Jim. <laughs> that's a very <laughs> unromantic answer. <laughs> See, you should have sent me that one earlier. I could have picked something up. <laughs> that was romantic. Uh, but anyway, um, uh, so, you know, there's a four, basically, I think it's about a 40 minute limit. And so we, we had to put the two pretty songs at the end, but after we did it, I liked, liked it because you almost needed some relief after the intensity of the big, the, the beginning of the record. Yeah. That said, Sal's Waltz, um, uh, was, uh, written after seeing Julian Lodge. And I was so inspired by him that I, I tried to write something, I don't know, with just inspired by him. And Sal is one of our cats. So <laughs> I just called it Sal's Waltz. There You Are, on the other hand, uh, was very, uh, you know, a very heartfelt song uh, uh, written about uh, my, how I feel when I see my fiance. And, uh, and that was really one from the heart. And uh, There You Are was a... Uh, a very uh, sincere title. So, uh, you know, they, they, they run the full gamut. Dude, know, congratulations. Uh, <laughs> thanks. Those two songs. So, and I'm glad you mentioned them. Um, yeah, they're, like, they're, they're really pretty, really pretty. Thanks. It's a perfect, you know, it's a real nice way to close, you know, get ready to close out the uh, disc. Did your fiance listen to the song? Oh yeah. She, re- she likes them yeah, a lot. Good. It's a really good song. Anything you are you working on anything else now that you're uh, like excited about? Really excited about um, last week. Uh, we uh, Joe Blaney, who's a, a producer. I know he's been involved with the Clash and the Ramones as well as you know uh, just a million artists. He's an old New York guy. I've been around. I, I've worked with him on a couple records, but just as a sideman asked me if I wanted to go down to the power station in New England and record for two days. And uh, when he first called me, I said, well, geez, Joe, I just put out a record. And he said, well, you know, you probably have some stuff. And I said, well, okay. So I thought about it and I uh, asked Josh and Chris, of course, but uh, I then asked this guitarist who I've always really admired, a guy named Gray McMurray. And uh, he uh, plays some, uh, he's like the opposite of me he plays uh, with a lot of effects, very atmospheric. Um, sometimes he's making a mountain of music and you don't even see his fingers moving, you know, it's, mm. but it's beautiful. It's just beautiful. And I had never played with him, but I, I had a gut feeling that it would be good just because like I said, good musicians create chemistry. Mm. So I said, look guys, why don't we go down there for a couple days and see what happens? And I went through my uh, file and realized that I had a whole bunch of tunes that I had forgotten about or that I thought would have only worked in a quartet. So we went down there and I brought my boomerang and my distortion unit and my wah-wah pedal and a bunch of guitars and an acoustic guitar. And we tracked for two days and we just got a ton of stuff. And Lord and behold, I have another record that I just can't wait to put out. Awesome. Um, Joe Blaney's currently sending me rough mixes. I think he even might have sent me a rough mix while we were talking, (laughs) actually. That's great, man. And and, uh, Yeah, it was really a gift, and I'm really excited about it. And as I said, we're going to play the 55 bar uh, this Sunday, which is, I don't know, March 11th, I think. Daylight saving time begins. And uh, we're going to start playing locally uh, as well. So uh, I'm really excited about that. You're 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 very enthusiastic in general, and having done this for so long, that's really inspiring. That your energy level and enthusiasm about what you do is is still just as you know you're just as driven and excited about it. So that's really cool. And you know, it's really funny. I read an article, and I just looked this up. I said, Joe Blaney, I know that name. I read an article. There's a website I subscribe to from the city, uh, you know, because I grew up there, and I always I stay and I like to pretend that I'm still living there uh it's called it's called the village society for historic preservation and they had an article about joe blaney in there at the end of november this past november and i emailed him because i said man that guy would be a great interview i never heard from him but that was that's i knew that name that was so funny small world sometimes you're originally you should email him again well i i i I, I will then i'll i'll email him and i'll say i just got off the phone with jim campolongo 
and he said, we, <laughs> we've got to connect. Um, hey, I'm, I'm your way in. <laughs> you're my, uh, you grew up in the Bay Area. Correct. What was your childhood like? You know, it was a, a, a working class, uh, you know, Italian American working class upbringing. You know, I, I my parents uh, were happily married, like for sixty years. Um, I had two older sisters, um, who actually turned me on to a lot of music. Uh, you know, we weren't exceptionally close, but I'd hear through the uh, the the bedroom wall. I, I remember hearing uh, the soundtrack for Easy Rider and. Uh, uh, the incredible string band, um, and stuff like that and Beatles and stuff like that. So, um, uh, that was good. Um, uh, and you know, I went to Catholic school for eight years and then went to public school, you know, in some ways it was, uh, fairly typical of yeah. that era. Yes, very much so. What, what kind of work did your dad do? My dad, um, was a teamster for, I think about 25 years about the union, and I know he met Jimmy Hoffa, um, the, but the union just was deteriorating. Uh, and it, uh, every year, my, I remember my father would be on strike, and uh, the, it, it would get longer and longer intervals. And I remember on Friday Fridays uh, back in the day, uh, you couldn't eat meat uh, on Fridays if you were Catholic. And... Uh, which they've now, they don't, they don't do that anymore, but you, we'd usually eat fish. But I remember when my father was on strike for a really long time, we couldn't afford fish. So we'd have waffles and I was always delighted. <laughs> yeah. Cause they're pretty you know, good. We got waffles for dinner. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I, I can't say I was uh, starving and miserable, sure. um, but after, uh, I, I have to hand it to him. Uh, I think when he was 43 or 44, he uh, went back to school and uh, took horticulture classes, and he passed, uh, I think, second in his class. And he got a job as a gardener working for the city of uh, South San Francisco, and he did that, I think, for another 20 years. So he had two retirements coming in, and, uh, you know, he was, a, he was a, you know, a man. And uh, so uh, that's my father's story. That's really cool. Do you think that's where you got your drive yeah. I mean, I don't think, I don't think he had like the, the same kind of drive I do, but I think that, um, uh, I mean, my father used to tell me, you know, to be, you know, that being a teamster was a good job or one time he suggested I become a dentist. Uh, and, uh, which I, you know, I think geez, looking back, you know, couldn't you do better than that? <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> 13 year old kid, you know, like, oh yeah, I want to become a dentist. But, uh, I got a great work ethic for, uh, from both my parents, uh, who were both, uh, you know, depression. My mother in particular was a depression era kid, mm. uh, where it's, you know, if, uh, if one is feeling a little glum, you know, the, the advice is, well, you should work harder. Right. And, uh, and my father, you know, sick or whatever, always went to work. Um, and, uh, I, I had, I started working when I was 12. That's how I was affording all those, uh, cream records and John McLaughlin and stuff. So I had paper routes and I, I was a, a vendor at Candlestick Park and, uh, you know, I sold shoes and did all kinds of jobs and, uh, uh, worked right out of high school. So now, I mean, uh, I still appreciate, what being a musician is. Um, sometimes, uh, I mean, I certainly wasn't a spoiled brat and, uh, you know, when I play a gig and it doesn't necessarily, uh, go the way I want it or the audience isn't, uh, the audience I would normally want to play for. Um, I think that old work ethic kicks in and, and I'm okay. You're able to make uh, lemonades out of lemon sort of. <laughs> yeah. I hear you. All right, so let's talk about gear for a few minutes, Jim. Since this is a uh, guitar show, I guess I'll have to do that. Uh, you're one of the few artists that's had sign signature guitars, not by one, but by two companies. So, number one, congratulations on that. And I think that speaks to 
you know, your talent and your appeal to guitarists all over. People generally don't make a signature guitar for somebody that's not a, that other people don't want to emulate, you know, that's the kind of the whole point from the, well, there's Trini Lopez. Everybody has a Trini Lopez guitar. <laughs> that's, that's like over 75. No, <laughs> anyway, I couldn't resist. <laughs> that's really nice. Thank you. <laughs> Is there a, is the process of getting a signature guitar made different with each company? Oh yeah. I mean, it was, um, I mean, night and day between Chiho and, uh, Fender custom shop. Uh, yeah, much different. And, and our, and our goals were much different. Uh, and so, yeah, it was totally different. It's way easier with Chiho. I mean, to be honest. Because it wasn't a big corporate entity and one guy got to make decisions and that was it, right? Yeah, I mean, though the the liaison uh, for the Fender was Mike Eldred and a great, you know, blues guitarist, great, great guy. Um, his heart was in the right place. And to paint them at all as like a huge corporate entity would be uh, not accurate. But that said... Um, you know, we were, we were, I knew we were making an expensive guitar. Um, and, and sometimes it was, uh, uh, harder to communicate, uh, what was right. Uh, and so, you know, I ended up having to fly to LA. Um, and, and I went to the uh, custom shop and said, yeah, this is, this is what I want and this kind of neck. So, I mean, just logistically it was difficult, but, I think Chiho and I, um, I mean, we talked about making a real boutique guitar in like a 59, like my guitar is a 59 top loader and trying again to like recreate this thing. Um, and one morning I woke up and I don't know about you, but I get my best ideas sometimes like the minute my eyes open. Mm. Uh, and I thought, why don't we make an $800 guitar and call it the Model C, like the Model T? So I, I called up uh, Chiho, or I emailed him, I guess, and and presented it to him. And for about a month and a half, he was trying to figure out how he'd make a guitar for 800 bucks. And finally, he said, look, you know, I'll go out of business, okay? Yeah. So, but that was our starting point. We ended up, it's fourteen ninety five, free shipping in the U.S. and a, and a free gig bag. And it's a, a really quality guitar. So I feel really good about it. It's not trying to be my 59. It's just trying to be a really good Telecaster. Do you want to um, talk about it? Do you want to talk about the guitar? Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Love to. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that, uh, what helped out is we, we just went for a pine body. And the other thing is I didn't want much, uh, finish on it. And Chio could explain this stuff way better than me, but he didn't have to put on, I don't know how many coats, 40 coats of paint. Um, because I, I don't like the way that looks. And so that helped. Um, also he has a great in-house, uh, pickup, uh, designer named Rob Banta, who uh, made pickups to my specifications, more or less. I wanted a, a very dark sounding tally. I've heard people say, well, what's dark? And I, I, you know, it's where I get frustrated talking about sound and pickups, but I just didn't want it to be a super trebly Telecaster. I, I don't like that sound uh, where it punishes the audience. Mm -hmm. So they're very full body pickups, uh, bassy for lack of a better word. Um, and the neck's really comfortable. It's a really, it's a solid boutique instrument that's affordable. So I feel really excited about it. And if, uh, you know, my friend Carl, who lives in Austria, just emailed me this morning and said, hey, I broke down and I bought one. And I just think, oh, that's great. You know, I, 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 I feel confident that Carl, who I think partially trusts and partially loves me, and basing that on why he's going to buy this guitar, like I don't feel squeamish about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I feel yeah. like he's he's playing a Baja Telly right now, and Baja Tellys are pretty good. But I think this is going to, you know, 
kick its ass. And I think Carl's going to be really happy. So, and Shiho and I are really enjoying that aspect. I mean, I'm not making us out to be Mother Teresa, but that said, you know, our heart and and, and philosophy was was grounded in in a good place when we were making these, and we aren't selling them for thirty seven hundred bucks. Um, that said, the Campolongo signature with Fender was pricey, but it was trying to be an and in some ways, successfully, my 59, it's a great guitar, um, and they're holding their value. And now and then I get a Google alert. They made 50 of them, a very limited number, and uh, they're still holding their value. And anybody who bought one of those, I think, has a great Fender guitar, uh, a unique guitar. And again, it had a lot of the aesthetic that um, we worked for at least a year and a half to attain. So, uh, you know, they're totally two different animals. These, uh, talk about the, the Han. Is that uh, maple neck only? Uh, correct. Okay. And is the neck thick, thin? It's kind of a C shape. Um, I'd say it's in between. You know, it's not a, it's not a big bulky neck. That's for sure. But it's not it's not a little neck either. Uh, it's right in between. I would think it uh, I would. Again, I wish Chiho was here because um, I, I, uh, I I'm very intuitive or I just say, oh, I like this. Mm. What is this? Yeah. You know, uh, so um, but I, I would describe it as a C neck. So kind of like them, like a modern like if you pulled a, a, a regular Fender standard telly off the rack, it's going to be like that. Yeah, I, I, I would think so. Something like that does seem a little like flat to me sometimes, but yeah, um, I think it's got a little rounder fingerboard uh, that makes it easier to bend, at least for me. I mean, it doesn't feel like a, a hammer or some like rock guitar, you know, sure. it still feels like a fendery kind of neck. Cool. And I think that's a really good price for like a boutique guitar, to be honest with you. I don't think that, I think that's like excellent. Well, thanks. I mean, we do too. I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, we really, we're, that was one of our priorities. That was, uh, if not number one, number two, you know, uh, and, and Chiho, Chiho is the guy who's making them, you know, so it's easier. It's easy for me to wake up and say, let's make an $800 guitar. But he's the guy who really has to manage his business, determine what's a realistic amount he could make every month. Sure. Uh, and he also makes these beautiful, beautiful boutique guitars that are, you know, they're, they're more expensive. And I've played those and they're worth every penny. I actually, that's how I met him. Uh, he came to a gig at the living room. He brought me uh, a t one of his Telecasters, and uh, the next night, I played it on David Letterman. Wow. <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about good timing, huh? It's, uh, there's, a, there's a little story about that on his website, uh, about that, and it's really sweet. That's awesome. Very cool. And how long? what's the lead time for these? Um, I think they're, you know, he says, I'm not sure. It, it's, it's, it's fairly quick. I think he says like six months or five, five weeks or six weeks. I can't even remember. It's not six months. I retract, I take that from the record. Um, <laughs> I, re but, uh, I redact I, that comment. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, but it's not, it's not that painfully long. Uh, and I know he just made a slew of them and he's shipping them out. And, uh, next week, I believe. Um, and you know, he called me up the other day and said, you want to do another run? And I said, yeah, let's do it. Uh, cause we were thinking we want to do a different model as well. Um, but this one seemed, people seem to want it. And so, uh, we want to keep going with it. Cool. And just where could people find that? Well, uh, on his website, uh, you know, you can Han guitars, model C H A H N. Correct. Cool. Thanks. No problem. Talk about uh, is what are your go to guitars right now? Like, what's your go to guitar right now, and and what other two guitars would round out your top three? Well, I mean, I've been playing this fifty nine for over twenty years, and I generally will play what's to the right or left of me. 
Okay. Um, and, uh, but my 59 is a very special instrument. I mean, I've kind of grown to appreciate it more uh, the last few years. Um, so if, you know, when I recorded last week, I brought my 59 and I brought my little uh, Martin 0015. Um, and those are probably the two guitars that I go to. But I, I pretty much, you know, I just got a Duo Sonic mm. and uh, I enjoy that guitar, but I, I pretty much just play my one guitar. I mean, I, uh, I'm not that, I mean, though I've had two signature models, um, I have a very simple aesthetic, um, and I'm not a guitar collector uh, by by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I, I kind of saw something before when we had video on that looked like a 335 Correct. hanging up on your yeah. Is that and if you know the uh, like that's a guitar I would like to get. Um, but I went to a guitar store and uh, I saw one and I thought, oh, that's exactly what I want. And it was eighteen thousand dollars. Yeah, well, I mean, mine was not eighteen thousand. Rest assured. <laughs> well, I, I mean, uh, what, what is your guitar? It's a two thousand fourteen Gibson three thirty five. Nice. And, and it the way it it uh, what happened was this is a really weird thing. I was in Nashville and I wanted to get a three thirty five. And I had a guy there named John Prestia. John is a guy I met from the show, and he is Tim McGraw. He's been Tim McGraw's guitar tech for 20 years. And he had a band down here in southwest Florida in the 90s, very big regional presence. So John and I you know, hit it off. We got along real well. And we were hanging out in his studio, and he had me playing all these old harmony guitars and old Gibsons that were like really – looks like a very fun day. And I – he knew I was looking for this guitar and we had, I had seen it online on Craigslist and another guitar player on the, at the time I, I asked him, I happened to be talking to him. I said, Hey, what do you think of this guitar? Cause I, I'm like cars. I mean, for me with the guitars, I'm, I'm like, I put the key in and start with a car. I'm like that with a guitar. I want to play it. And I'm not a, a really a guitar nerd. I'm a tone nerd. I like sounds, but I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, going to, pull the thing apart and fix it so the the guy i was talking to said be careful because that bigsby was put on after market and so i had visions in my head of some guy like me you know drilling it in his garage i'm like okay well, that's out well we go up there and we call up the guy and it turns out he works at gibson and gibson put it on and so and then they put that little sticker on there to make it look like the old vintage ones they used to have so you know the guy came over showed us a guitar i loved it and again i always try to ask people smarter than me when i'm making decisions uh i said john i love it it sounds great feels great what do you think he goes if you don't buy it i will great endorsement i bought it so um you know but it it was very reasonably priced it was the guy was looking to get rid of it. I, it was a rare situation where I was in the right place at the right time to buy something. Well, that's great. And you know, it's a, it's a, a good price. I mean, my friend Luca Benedetti, who I work with and I co-produce records with, um, uh, has actually got me more interested in different guitars because he's so smart and he's such a good guitarist. And he, he's, he'll say, Hey, I got this gold foil you know, pickups. And I re ended up really liking the sound. And, but that said, um, I, I'm very happy just having one guitar and the things I'm interested in are, well, how could I play, you know, F sharp minor, B flat minor to E flat nine to A flat seven. And with this little movement as possible, that sounds really good. And <clears throat> what, how would Buddy Emmons do it? And how would Wes Montgomery do it? Like, those are the things that I'm really interested in that I spend my time doing. And one thing I find uh, that is unattractive, I guess, for lack of a better word, is some of the guitar heroes nowadays are real consumers, <laughs> you know, and, uh, their, their, their music, it seems to be equal with like that. They bought an 1840 Les Paul, you know, or something like that. And I, I don't like that really. Uh, I don't find that like that wouldn't, I, I wouldn't want those kind of people to be my guitar hero and my guitar heroes 
had a sense of humility, even Jeff Beck, you know, who's yeah. pretty alpha. And, you know, I mean, I saw him a couple of times when I was in high school and I didn't care what kind of guitar he had. You know, I think he was playing a Les Paul when I saw him. I just thought, you know, I, li- I like his music. And, uh, and I still feel that way. Like, I mean, people ask me a lot about my guitar and I'm really lucky that I have a 59 Telecaster that originally cost $2,000 when, uh, it was given to me by a guy who paid $2,000 for it. A guy named John Jensen. You were given uh, that guitar. Yeah. Yeah. For, was given. Like a, a, a mentor of yours. Well, um, it's kind of a long story, but uh, John took lessons from me, and he said, if I ever learn guitar, that, you know, he brought this 59 over, and I just fell in love with it. And it was it was strange, because a lot of things I was working on at the time seemed to fall into place when I played that guitar. And uh, so I borrowed it for a while, and then finally I said, look, John, i got to give this thing back to you, because it's, it's just driving me crazy that it's not mine and he, he said no you can keep it i said no 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 i, I don't want it i go you take it back and i had a different telecaster and i thought i'd live happily ever after anyway he told me that if he ever really got good on the guitar that uh he'd give give that telly to me and i was giving him lessons and uh so i was giving him lessons uh, for a couple of years and you know he was kind of not making any great progress and uh one day he showed up with a bass and uh, he said, I want to play bass now. And so I started showing him bass and we went through this James, Jamie, uh, James Jamerson yeah. book that I barely could stay ahead of John because uh, I'm not a bass player. And uh, John learned the bass. And one day he showed up with that telly and he said, you know, I learned bass. Here's this Telecaster. And at first I wouldn't take it when he insisted on it and, uh, I'm ever grateful. Uh, that's and awesome. so that's, yeah, but, and he paid 2000 bucks for it, which is a lot of money. Um, but it isn't $18,000, you know? Yeah, I wouldn't. You know, I, that's, do you know, uh, you ever heard of a, a, bland, a band called um, Blackberry Smoke? What's her name? Blackberry Smoke. No, I, I, I'm sorry to say I haven't. Uh, I interviewed, they're a really good band out of uh, Atlanta, I believe. And I interviewed Charlie Starr, who is their uh, guitar player. And he was an excellent guitar player. He was given like a 68 Les Paul custom by, and he talked about this on the show, by a fan of his who was apparently dying or you know on his way out. And he felt that he wanted a, a good you know that guitar that he's had that really hasn't been used he wanted it to go to a good place so i i don't think that although it's not common obviously it, it's not you know that bizarre that when you know you i think as a musician you have a a very big influence on people in many ways that you probably or maybe you do you, you don't know well yeah i mean it was uh, probably that's true, and it's a long history of uh, uh, people, uh, musicians, uh, you know, were there, and the king was supporting them. <laughs> uh, you know, Mozart and Bach and all those guys. Um, so, yeah, I think people uh, sometimes, I mean, at the time, uh, this is way back when, uh, you know, $2,000 was, I probably... I don't know. I, I probably couldn't afford that at the time. Sure. Um, so uh, it, it was very, very nice. And I think people that can't afford it. And John, John Jensen, who gave it to me, was a guitar collector. You know, he was uh, I think it was back in the day. He was at the time he was a car painter. But, you know, he he could afford to buy a guitar every couple of months. And he had quite a collection at one time. Um, I mean, nowadays, geez, I mean, there's. If you buy something, it's that expensive. I, I, I don't know why anybody would want to bring it out of the house, though I bring my guitar out of the house and I travel with it mostly. I might bring the Han next time. You, you travel uh, with the 59? Oh, yeah. In a, in a gig bag that's like a pillowcase. <laughs> really? Doesn't that scare the shit out of you? Well, sometimes. I mean, if uh, there is, uh, you know, I, I, br- I want it to be light. 
and I don't want to I don't want to hassle with a hard case and a handle. And so I bring the cheapest gig bag I have just because it's light on my back. And usually it's no problem to bring it, you know, stick it in an overhead. But the last time I went to Finland on the way back, they were really hassling me about bringing it on. And it was, you know, it's 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 weird because the flight wasn't even full. You know, sometimes a, 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 a you know, a, a airline employee, I don't know what they're thinking, but they just get a little power crazy. But I ended up being able to bring it on. But it was so, so stressful that I thought I don't ever want to do this again. Yeah, I can't blame you. That is stressful, man, especially that guitar like that. That's worth so much. Yeah. And by the way, anybody listening, if you want to listen to that story with Charlie Starr, it was in episode 129. I think it came out January the 8th, 2018. Jim, one question about your playing. You, because you are so ambitious and so driven, I'm imagining, or I'm imagining, I know you're always looking to improve and grow as a player. And I was curious, over the last five years, if your playing has changed at all? And if so, in what way? Well, I think it's changed. I mean, it's definitely a lot more free um, and uh, a little more devil. Uh, what's that expression? Devil may care. Um, I used to be a little more concerned about, uh, you know, playing something that I thought was uh, – you know, all, my, all the hairs were in place and it was a perfect solo and all that. And now I just think I, I want to jump in there and get a vibe. Um, and I think uh, my skill has allowed me to do that without making a total fool out of myself. Um, so I think it's changed in that way. I just I, I have a way a lot more of a jazz mentality. Um and I think that, you know, in some ways I've become a better jazz guitarist. Uh, I always had kind of a, not a love-hate relationship with jazz, but sometimes I felt like I was learning songs because I felt I like I had to, you know, mm -hmm. um, like Stella by Starlight or something like that. You know, I, I, I thought, do I really like this song? I mean, and, uh, you know, I don't think I do. I, I don't think I like that song. Um, I like the way Jim Hall plays it on, uh, I think it's called Jazz Guitar. And I, there, there's players that play it and I like it, but I don't think I do. And uh, But that said, there's, there's many, many uh, standards that I do really love. And uh, I've, like Round Midnight, which I think is going to be on the upcoming record. And that's a very difficult song. Um, I mean, if you listen to the Wes Montgomery version, it sounds like he's playing a nursery rhyme, but Wes was, you know, incredible. Uh, and uh, I think I've become a better jazz guitarist, and I'm playing jazz in the way I hear it. I'm not regurgitating two fives or uh, – playing like okay you know i've memorized shakespeare and now i'm a thespian who knows shakespeare i i'm i got, it took a while to get inside it uh then throw things out that i thought might be cliche and 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 think hard and and be introspective on well what do i want this to sound like and what's what's me here um so i think that's been improved uh, i at least i'd like to think so I, you you strike me as being a guy that's extremely authentic in whatever you do. So I, I and I would imagine that comes across loud and clear to people. So whatever you're doing, I I I know people are, I know it's authentic, and I I would imagine everybody listening, you know, feels the same way because you're pretty straightforward, man. Well, I hope so. I mean, I I find it. Um Sometimes I see players, and I'm not a very critical guy, especially if you're my friend. I'll, I'll like what you play if I like you. <laughs> but, you know, I don't go out and think. I mean, I, I, I pretty much root for musicians, and I, I, I think it's a, a great way to spend your time. Um, and uh, so I'm not a very – I'm not a real negative Nelly when I see groups. But if I am, sometimes I, I, I don't care for the whole alpha blues thing, you know, like Steven Seagal plays the blues. Um, and sometimes I don't like that. I'll see a player – and I, I think, let's say his name's Joe, you know, I'll hear him play and I think, well, that's good, but where's Joe? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah, he's not present, but and he's not he's not showing up. He's he's playing, but he's not showing up. But the downside of that is, I think you know, I have my own style, and uh, you know, sometimes people will go, "Wow, you're so crazy," and you know, it's so weird. <laughs> I think really, I'm just trying to make it beautiful. But you know, I, again, I think it's just that it isn't what people expect. Um, uh, you know, so, um, and, and when I grew up, when I was learning, like having your own style was, um, a strength, uh, you know, uh, uh, it helps sell records. Mm -hmm. Um, and sometimes I feel like things have become a little more generic, uh, as of late, like I hear solos and I think, you know, that, that all that solo did was not attract attention. Yeah. I get what you're saying. Sometimes, but yeah, you know, I, I kind of want my personality in it and I think about it and I think about the lyrics and I don't know, I, I, maybe I'm just rambling now. No, I think, you, I think what you're saying is authenticity is really important to you, not just for you, but you think in general, your philosophy about music is that that's what you should be aspiring to, being authentic, because it's a waste of time to be somebody else that you can't be anyway. So what the hell? You know, might as well, right. even if it's... Yeah, that's what uh, I meant to say. Yeah. <laughs> but um, bump. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I mean, that was... But <laughs> did, did, you, did you study music? Like in school, you know, I not no, I didn't. I, um, so. I I met a uh, uh, you know the guy across the street, Austin Slater, who I thought was you know one of the greatest guitarists in the world. <laughs> <laughs> um, I asked him who his teacher was, and uh, this woman named Bunny Gregoire taught him, and uh, she was in downtown South San Francisco at this store called Bronstein's, and uh, I could take the bus there. So um, I booked a lesson with her and I got there and she was kind of a, I, I mean, I guess she was in her 60s. Again, your whole sense of age is warped when you're 14. Yeah. But I think she was in her 60s and she was a beatnik and she'd be, uh, you know, she spoke kind of beatnik. Um, you know, when cats are playing. <laughs> you know, and uh, and I really just kind of fell in love with her. I mean, I just thought, wow, this is the most interesting person I've I've met in my life. And uh, so I studied with her for about a year and a half, and uh, and she was great. She was really encouraging to me, and and uh, you know, I just feel like I'm melting thinking about it she was just so encouraging and i kind of needed that um at the time and uh but after a year and a half she was giving me stuff that um like she she wanted me to go in the george van epps book and now i think that's a great book but i just wanted to learn the intro to spoonful and uh <laughs> so i quit taking lessons and uh I ended up taking lessons from this guy, Dennis Young, who was kind of like a local hero who knew all that stuff. And in a lot of ways, it was like seeing, uh, you know, getting uh, discovering this Dead Sea Scrolls and seeing it, uh, it translated. So uh, he helped me quite a bit. And uh, and that was it. Uh, I it I'd say then I kind of just in some ways wasted time until I was probably about 30 and decided to get serious when I was 30. And, uh, I did the best I could. A guy named Mark Baum, who is a horn player, really helped me with, uh, analyzing, uh, harmony and progression. And, uh, and then I started giving lessons and, um, at this music store, I went into this it was called Ceremony Music, and it was uh, in a shopping mall in Ceremony. I actually wrote a song. What on is that, Ceremony? A Ceremony is uh, it's a place like in Daly City. What is that? I don't even know what Daly City is. Is that California? Uh, like, yeah, Daly City is on the outskirts of San Francisco. Okay. But it was this big shopping mall. And I went in there one time, and they, some guy said, hey, you want to be a guitar teacher? Our guitar teacher is leaving. And I said, Okay. And so uh, I started and I had I inherited like 12 little kids <laughs> who could all read better than I could. That's funny, uh, man. 
But it was the beginning of a long journey where I really learned a lot. And, uh, and that's kind of how I learned, um, uh, you know, uh, about music and reading and progression. And, um, and uh, uh, arpeggios really helped me. I got this book by Jay Friedman. I forget what it's called, uh, arpe- but it was basically every arpeggio. And so I learned about what's in a chord, and uh, and and I, I love. I, I still think my playing's very arpeggio based. Um, it is. It is for sure. And so, um, and that's how I teach. I mean, I teach actually smaller triad based improv um, as opposed to modal improv uh, f- to people because uh, that's mainly like a lot of the students I get don't know how to play over changes. They can play the blues scale and all that stuff, but uh, they don't know really how to play uh, over a chord change, even if it's one, four, five. And so, uh, you know, uh, two guys really helped me with that. A guy named Jimmy Rivers, who is kind of one of my guitar heroes uh, on this record called Jimmy Rivers and the Cherokees. I met him and he gave me a couple guitar lessons and they were invaluable. And uh, so, and there was another guy named Duncan James, who I took a couple of lessons from, and uh, he also kind of just showed me a simple triad. He was a really, he was really a trip. I was there, and I, you know, I was basically still fumbling to find like a C major seven chord or a D minor seven flat five. And he got a call during my first lesson. I mean, basically, I was still a rock guy, and. Uh, he got a call from this jazz singer who needed like a, a backup guitarist for like a three or four hour gig of playing standards, you know, and, and being the, the only music, you know, accompanist there. And uh, he, he was busy. He looks at me, he goes, hey, are you busy uh, tomorrow night? I, I have a gig. And I said, I don't know any standards. <laughs> He, he covered the phone with his left hand, you know, where you speak into. He goes, look, Jim, you book the gig and let the chips fall where they may. Very cool. Very cool. So you did. You did it. And how did the yeah. gig go? I did not take the gig, and I'm really glad I didn't. Oh, you didn't <laughs> take the gig. Sad. No, oh. but I still think of his advice now. <laughs> That's interesting. It's a, it's a good philosophy. But not if you don't know any standards you know, and you got to back up a jazz singer for three hours. I don't think it's a good idea, but uh, I really like what he said. <laughs> Let's uh, go under the hood a bit. Let, what's, what's your best childhood memory? Um, uh, that's a tough one. I mean, childhood, what, what era? Like, do you have to be uh, under 12? You pick. Well, we used to go on these yearly picnics uh, with my father. My father had this uh, – he'd play pinochle with these guys every Friday. And they called themselves Pogo Bo, which stood for poker, golf, and bowling. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. And, and they were really good guys. They were all basically teamsters. And they, you know, they play kind of penny ante pinochle, but they were serious about it. And I think if anybody got winnings, they threw it in a pot. And at the end of the year, they'd get their little pot with it, maybe turned into a couple hundred bucks. And we'd go on this yearly picnic called the Pogo Bo Picnic. Very cool. And it was really really fun. And they were all really good men, you know. Um, I I still uh, marvel at what good guys they were, you know, I mean, in this day of Harvey Weinstein and all that kind of stuff, I feel so lucky that all the men in my life were such good men. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so I used to really love those picnics and my father, we had a station wagon. He'd make a little space for me in the back cause it was all packed up with paper plates and, and sausage and fresh bread. We'd go to the bakery in the morning and we'd go on the Pogobo picnic, and I'd see their, the families of these card-playing guys once a year. Let me just tell people where they could find you, and if you want to talk about any of these things, uh, let's do that. Uh, you have, first of all, Jim's at jimcampilongo.com, C-A-M-P-I-L-O-N-G-O.com, and he's got 12 records out. You really should 
go check out his last record live at Rockwood. It's available on his website. Uh, he also has a Rockwood residency. When is that, Jim? Uh, it's every Monday. Every Monday night at Rockwood. And you have another residency, what, the 55 Club, correct? The 55 Bar. 55 and that's bar. Um, and where Jaco Pistorius played. And, you know, it's got a real famous history. And we play there the second Sunday of every month from 6 to 9. And I love those hours. <laughs> yeah, that is good. That's good, man. And you can find him online and Instagram on Twitter at his name, Jim Campolongo. And he also has a, a hundred lessons online that are available for download. So I would encourage you to check that out. And that's right on his website again, jimcampolongo.com. What is the tab they look for for that? Um, it's on the homepage. You just go to the left and it says lessons, I think, uh, something like that. It's pretty obvious. Every, listen, I, I really appreciate your time. I'm really glad I got the chance to connect with you, man. And, um, uh, you know, I'll definitely come and check you out when I'm in the city when you're playing for sure. Yeah, it was a total pleasure talking to you, Craig. Thanks a lot. And everybody, please check out Jim. He's uh, and really, if you haven't heard him play, he's a phenomenal. He's like I, when I opened this up, I said we have a guitar player's guitar player. That's Jim for sure. And uh, everybody, thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this interview as much as I did. Thanks again to Jim Campolongo for spending time with us. I really appreciate it. Go to everyonelovesguitar.com. Sign up to get notified about future episodes along with early product announcements and discounts. And remember, most importantly, happiness is a choice. So be nice, go play a guitar, and have some fun. Till next time, thanks for listening. Peace and love, and I'm out. We hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, subscribe to the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on iTunes. And if you like the show, please leave us a five-star positive review. The more five-star reviews we get, the higher our show ranks, and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool, interesting guests on our show. We'll see you on the next episode, and until then, keep playing your guitar and have fun making music. 